Hi, this is an overview of budgeting for school districts. It really complements information you may have on budgeting in the for-profit world. The budgeting concepts for schools are similar as they are in the for-profit world. The difference is that the education is what's being produced or manufactured. So instead of determining how many type A, B, and C widgets need to be manufactured, the output is how many students need to have which classes. And if you're producing widget A, B, and C, you stop and think about, well, then I need so much of material X, Y, and Z. In the school districts, they've got the same kind of thing. In order to produce an education for students, you've got to make sure you have the required course offerings. After that, the rest of budgeting is allocating the limited resources to achieve the needed results. Budgets allocate limited resources. This helps management plan how they're going to achieve their goals. In the planning stages, management can compare their budget to estimated spending percentages in specific areas. Key performance indicators are selected to let management know that things are operating as scheduled or that things need to be modified because they're not going as well as planned. As the year progresses, the key performance indicators are examined and the results are compared to the budget. That lets management know how they're doing. Financial control is another reason to budget. The school board approves the budget and in turn controls how the money is being spent. Finally, the feedback reports should be clear, concise, and be completed often enough for management to take action and improve the situations if needed. Budget planning is like a map. It provides directions from where you are to where you want to be or what you want to achieve. So you need to ask yourself, what is our current financial position and what is our current academic position? Then, what is our goal? Both financially and academically. Once you know your end result, you need to look at the resources you have, the resources you need, and what problems may arise. But when do we do that? There is a budget calendar to develop the budget and have it approved by the school board. So that calendar entails a process that must start a year or so in advance to get going. And there might be some unknowns. Are there salary negotiations going on? The budget can't wait for those salary negotiations to be completed in order to be finalized. So you've got to build the best guess into the initial budget, knowing that you're going to have to adjust it later. The same thing is going forward. It's planning for a long trip, a long map. So it really should be done as part of a multi-year budget. These are really the steps used in planning. What assumptions do we have? What assumptions are pretty solid? What's our projected enrollment? How about our expect expenditures? What is each program going to cost? Do we have grants? And what is a grant going to require in order to receive those funds? That's the order we're going to collect our information and analyze it. We're going to use that to develop the annual budget and the multi-year budget. We're also going to make sure that the annual budget coming in for the next year is much more detailed than the budget that's going to be projected three years down the road. And finally, all of this information should be developed in a system that's going to allow us to prepare for the annual audit. That way we don't have to do extra work when the auditors come in to look at the books. We can always make the assumption that we're not going to have enough. We never have enough to do all the things we want. So there's lots of things that might cause that assumption to be realistic. The local tax might change. Our tax base may change. State fund funding may change. We're not going to get the money in that we thought we were going to have or that we anticipated 
when we created the multi-year budget last year or the year before. We also have too many expenditures. There are too many good things that we could do if we had the money. But we've got to make sure that we meet the required education needs. We also have to take care of our individuals with the retirement contributions. And then we can't forget any new mandate that's come down that we must follow for the next year. That information was certainly not a part of the budget that we created in the past. So we need to make sure we make those adjustments and we need to assume the information. If we don't have the actual amounts, we need to come up with the best estimate that we can. Then, before we know how much we're going to cut from the budget or how much we're going to cut from our expenses, we should prioritize them. What is it that we really want to do? So thinking about it logically now before we have the dollar amounts makes for the best decision making. Some schools may cut AP classes. Some schools may not. That may not be part of their, who they are. Some schools may cut specials like music and art. And some may cut sports, either teams or other recreational activities. These certainly are not desired, but if you had to cut programs, what would you cut and why? Those are direct programs. What about the size of programs? Could we cut costs by making larger class sizes or by offering fewer electives? Come up with some what ifs. If we have to cut $10,000, what would we get rid of? If we had to cut $5,000, what would we get rid of? And start to rank those out and get your priorities in order before you know what's going to fit. Then your decision making is going to be a little more sound. The funds coming into our school are based on the student enrollment. And we have to plan for the future. That's why part of this annual budget and multi-year budget. So is the population aging or getting younger? If your demographics in your neighborhoods are aging, then you probably can expect enrollment to be decreasing. Whereas if you have new young families moving in, you may need to plan to build because you're going to have more of an inflow into your school. And what dynamics do they bring? Are families having children later? There are studies that say people that have children later want to have their children into college prep programs. There's others that disagree with that. It's going to base on your neighborhood. And how about the number of families and the number of children they're having? Is it different for your area as compared to other areas within your state? What about the national trends? Understanding what's happening locally and nationally will help you make enrollment projections. And knowing what's happening in the local, state, and federal area really make a difference because of the state funding and the federal funding and how it impacts your school. This is an old report. I just put it in here because I wanted to show you how much is actually local dependent and state dependent and how your enrollment projections are really going to be important later on. There are modeling programs out there that can be done online in Excel, etc. And they'll help you project how many students you're going to have. That's important because you're going to receive so much per student. Moving averages, linear regression, and exponential smoothing are three techniques that help determine what your enrollment might be. The cohort survival is an added piece that you need to make sure you consider. Some towns have a 99.8% cohort survival, meaning most of the students that come in that school stay in that school and graduate. Others have a bigger dropout rate and they don't survive and they don't end up graduating. That's gonna affect how many students are in each class. So you need to be very aware of your local, 
happenings and your trends. Finally, beware of the ad hoc, that gut feeling. I just have a gut feeling these students are gonna stay because we're gonna come up with great programs or we're gonna keep them here in our schools. That gut feeling can be very faulty. I know of numerous people in the healthcare industry that built budgets based on their gut feeling and they were wrong and they're no longer employed. It's really important to know your trends and trust your numbers. You might have a gut for a very few anomalies that might affect the projected enrollment, but they should be few and far between in order to make your enrollment accurate. In the for-profit world, we have to know how many units are gonna be sold in order to know how many units we need to make. And then we back that into how many pounds of material will we need. The same thing happens with enrollment. Once we know how many students we expect to have in each class, K through 12, we now can back it up. How many, class, how many classes are we gonna have? What are our guidelines? How many students per class? Since we're gonna be trying to cut costs every time we turn around, can this class size be reduced? That's what we'd like. Maybe we're gonna have a policy and that's our what if. What if our goal is to have 27 students per class? But we might go up to 30 or 31, but as soon as we hit 32, we're gonna divide it up and have two sections. So we might have two sections of 16. What if we're sitting on 30 students? What if one more comes? Does that matter? What if one more student leaves? How are we, we gonna handle those scenarios? That's gonna tell how many sections are needed. And maybe we're gonna do it by per grade. And it might be one year has a large class. And instead of having seven homerooms for every class in grades nine through 12, maybe this one big group, we've got eight this year and seven for the rest of the sections. And as that class moves into their sophomore year, they have eight and everybody else has seven. As it moves to their junior year, they have eight, everybody else has seven. So you need to know how many sections are gonna be needed per grade and also per building. Does this make a difference? Do we have to change the way our buildings are organized? And what about the future? This is where knowing the trends, are people moving into your neighborhood? Are people moving out of your neighborhood? How is this going to affect your future classes? We've talked about enrollment and we've talked that federal, state, and local funding is gonna be per student. And maybe we wanna try something. Maybe there's a grant because our school is in need based on enrollment. Maybe it's in need of something new. So there's lots of reasons we might have a grant. Maybe there's been a grant in place Will that grant continue? Will we get funds for that grant in the next year? Great questions. As state budgets are cut, as federal budgets are cut, or as new people come into office and move something to their favorite cause, does that affect your grant? So will the grant continue? Is the amount of the grant affected by sequestration? Remember, that's the agreement that things are gonna be cut going forward in, in a pro rata basis to make sure that the federal government can meet the budget. Is that part of it? If you're okay, you need to confirm that you're gonna be receiving the funding. Once you know you're gonna be receiving the funding, you need to take a serious look at the grant. What requirements exist? Do you have to hire someone special? Do you have to have a dedicated room or dedicated lab space? What do you need to spend to bring the grant money in? And what about reporting requirements? When it's all said and done, how do I prove that I've done the work to get the money? So you need to consider all aspects of the grant. This step, I'm putting it here because I'm ending the, the funding uh, cash in, but it really could go later too. We're in the middle of collecting all the data. 
And once we have it, we need to count it up. Now, I put it in different funds because as I'm allocating the money out, maybe I've got to make sure it can only go in those funds. So you'll see that local and intermediate sources, some money's coming into the general fund, some to the debt service, and some to the food service fund. Like, like, um, likewise, you've got grant revenue that's only going to the special projects funds because you've got a, you have a grant that only does one thing. However you sum your amounts, you need to make sure you can account for all the cash coming in. And if you have special restrictions, you need to make sure they're put in special funds so they are not spent improperly. Because we're a school, we need to talk about the instruction first. But is there a goal? The part of the strategic plan is our outcome. Is this a district goal for some of these instructional programs? Or is it just the popular one that people in the school like, the parents like? And then we just don't look at the amount that we're paying a faculty member. We actually need to look at that person's salary, benefits. And then we've got to go beyond the payroll. Do they need certain tools? Do they require certain computer equipment? How about supplies? Think of a biology lab. They need certain supplies just to offer that particular program. Then we talk about cost and results. Is it worth the cost? So we've got this extra program where we want to have this special biology lab and we have to spend money to bring in the items the students are going to analyze. We're going to spend $3,000 bringing that in. But the results are really going to make that much of a difference in a student's education. It might be something interesting, it might be something they remember, but from an academic perspective, it's really not any different than what we were doing before. So kind of that cost-benefit analysis, you're going to do cost-result analysis. And then we do want to know which expenditures are continuous. Buying the beakers in the chemistry lab, I'm not going to buy a new set every year. I'll buy chemicals every year. So I'll have to make sure I know exactly what I'm spending and how much I'm going to spend this year, next year, the following year, etc. We've got some other projections that we need to take care of. An FTE is a full-time equivalent of the hours worked by one employee on a full-time basis. It basically is used to convert the hours worked by several part-time employees into the hours worked by full-time employees. And some employees are naturally going to leave, so the FTE may change. It may be easier to alternate how we're handling the part-time employees. So we need to look at that as well. And then we've got the critical mass argument with our expenses. So for example, we pay a bus company so much per bus or per student. What if the bus route changes because we have so many students that have now moved to a different location or we have a lot less students? Can we change the bus route to make that half empty bus a little more full. And maybe by doing that, we can reduce the number of buses we have. Is that going to help us? And then what is our population looking at? Some schools are offering engineering. Some schools are offering vocational classes. What is the trend? Do we need more of one than the other? We don't really want half empty classrooms. So what is more desirable? What is really part of our strategic plan? Looking at our trends. What about our building? Is our building getting older? Are we meeting the state requirement for how many square feet per student? Does that mean we need new construction? And what kind of construction do we need? What about combining schools? and having larger schools, but maybe we've got the elementary in one section, one, one building, 
and the middle school in a different building. Does that help? What construction do we need to make that happen? How about changes in school offerings? Lots of schools are getting rid of the half-day kindergarten. You're going to change from half-day to full-day. Well, if you had two half-day classes and they're now two full-day classes, I need another classroom. And how about the changing demographics? Are people moving in with older children? Do we have to make sure that I'm ready at the high school level? I need to make sure I can project what building needs I have, what capital needs I have. And some expenses are very easy to plan, while others are more difficult. It may be best to start with last year's expenditures and consider what outliers existed last year. Was there an emergency? Was it flooding or extreme cold? Or did the water pump have an unplanned break? Was there an expenditure that was needed but pushed off until the next year? And now we have to deal with it. Finally, what are the expenses that are in line? Are they in line with the statistics provided by the National Center for Educational Statistics? Are we meeting those? Probably not, but why not? Does the national percentage provide some type of insight or better ways to appropriate the funds? When all is said and done, we need to align the expenses in the optimal way to meet the strategic plan. But we can't forget that we have certain requirements. We have certain contracts we might have, certain that we have to take care of the utilities, repairs and maintenance, and other expenses. Bottom line, we have to come up with a good estimate as to how much these expenditures will be. Here's some percentages from the National Center for Educational Statistics. Are these in line with your school? Once we have our projected expenses, we're going to go ahead and allocate them. We're going to allocate them in the same funds that we had the revenue taken care of, and that's our budget. When we're finished, we've got to build our budget in such a way that helps us manage. So we're going to build in key performance indicators. We're going to build in things that we know every month we should have certain ratios that are going to be met. We're going to have reconciliations done to make sure that our cash is being managed, that our capital expenses are being managed. We need to make sure we note when reconciliations are done and what reconciliations are done. And we need to make sure that they are being done. Because when the auditors come in for the annual audit, one of the worst things that could happen from an embarrassing point of view is for the auditor to say that the money has not been managed properly. So we need to make sure the reconciliations are taken care of. We need to make sure if we're not meeting the key performance indicators that somebody's looking at it and making sure it's done right. We need to make sure we're handling inventory and we're properly marking it off at the end of our year so we know exactly how much inventory we have on the last day of the year. And then we need to make sure that we're taking care of the year-end closing in a timely and appropriate manner so we can close the books, compare the actual expenditures to the budget expenditures, and we can be ready for next year's budget. So in summary, you need to plan, 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 plan some more, Plan to change your plan and make sure you've got ways to report out the information.